morning, everyone. My name is Gerard Keiter. I'll be chairing this uh, webinar. Um, let me just start my video. I'll be chairing this webinar. This webinar on the Emerald Book has been arranged by the South African National C Committee on Tunneling, SANCOT, under the auspices of the SAIMM. Um, I'm the chairman of SANCOT and I'm I mean the Vice Chairman of SANCOT and our Chairman, Mr. Ron Klucek, he's offered his attended uh, his apologies. He can unfortunately not sit in on this webinar, so I'll be chairing this, this session. Um, just as a quick introduction to uh, the Emerald Book, that was a joint collaboration between the International Engineering Federation, FIDIC, and the International Tunneling Association, ITA. It was launched at the World Tunnel Congress in 2019 in Naples, um, and it covers contractual standards for underground works. Uh, it was done by a joint task group of FIDIC and ITA and it specifically addresses uh, various issues uh, in terms of underground works, namely allocation of risk, disclosure of all available geology and geotechnical information, inclusion of geotechnical contractual baselines, inclusion of uh, unforeseeable physical conditions clauses in, in the contract documentation, implementation of ground classification systems and particular support conditions to reflect the effort of excavation and st stabilization on the site, time for completion to be uh, influenced by ground conditions and also to provide a flexible, flexible mechanism for remuneration according to ground conditions, both foreseen and unforeseen. Now the, the presentation will be uh, done by Matthias Neuenschwander, uh, Matthias has got an MEC in civil engineering from ETH Zurich in Switzerland and he specialized in FIDIC contracts and dispute ad adjudication and commercial mediation. Uh, Matthias has been a member of the FIDIC contracts com committee. He's a past chair and current liaison of FIDIC uh, task group 10 and he's also the animateur of ITA working group 3 on contractual practices. Uh, Matthias is a member of various uh, societies like the Swiss Society of Engineers and Architects, the Swiss Tunneling Society, the Dispute Board Federation and the Tunnel Contracts Association of TCTA uh, and various others. Um, and then lastly, he currently sits on two dispute adjudication boards for tunnels and highways. He's the single ad hoc adjudicator of a dispute and on a highway and the mediator in international multicultural dispute on, on a dam. So without further ado, I'm handing over to Matthias uh, with the recording of this webinar. Thank you, Matthias, over to you. Thank you, Gerhard. <coughs> um, I would like to thank Sankot for having me here. Oh, so sorry. <laughs> of course, here we are. Um, <clears throat> I hope you can all see this. So, as I said, I would like to thank Sankot. I would like uh, to thank in particular uh, Ron Klusek for asking me to, uh, to do this short walk across the MO book, uh, Camila for organizing all this, Gerhard for chairing the session, and all you present for the interest you take in uh, uh, what the task group 10 has been doing over the past years. Um, <clears throat> I was told I would have approximately 40 minutes for my presentation. Um, there will be time for questions and answers afterwards. And uh, this is what I'd like to do with you over the past, over the next roughly one hour uh, on a total. <clears throat> so, why do we need a specific form of contract for uh, underground works? Well, over 50% of the world's population currently live in cities and this number is growing. In uh, 2050, about 70% of all people in the world will, will be living in cities and uh, this will call for a different use of space and we can go, of course, into height, we can go into the air or we can go below ground if, you, if we need more space and for many things to go below ground really will be the solution. Also, <clears throat> and this is statistics, underground works are risk prone. 
Um, there is a 90% certainty of an average 33% cost overrun and a 23% time overrun, and this regardless of the risk assessment made by project protagonists. Now, this is of course due that very often risk assessment is biased. There is a strong optimism bias in underground works, maybe even stronger than in other kinds of works because the unknown unknown is not taken into account as it really should be. What we see in Europe is that when you're in an early project stage, uh, let's say a, a preliminary design or a, a feasibility study, you should uh, you should have a uh, uh, you you should have you should make um, a reserve for contingency of over 50% on top of your calculated cost. Now, very often this is not done and very often this will lead to a cost and a time overrun, of course. Now, why do we need a specific form of contract? This is the uh, highest uh, skyscraper in the world. It's the Burj Khalifa. Although I'm not quite sure this is the Burj Khalifa because as I was told, this is the Burj Khalifa. The other one is, is, is a little less high and there is a difference which is about 20 stories or so. Now, if an owner decides once he has awarded a contract for a skyscraper to add 20 stories to his building, it is obvious to everybody that the cost will not be the same and then time that time will not be the same. Unfortunately, when it comes to underground works, very often people find that this should not apply. Although we have very similar situations and we have very similar situations all too often. Let's take this kind of an example. Of course, this is a mock example, but it is very close to reality. We have a foreseen geology of solid rock and the, uh, the upfront soil investigation showed that there should be one difficult fault zone of 500 meters and there would be a contractual time for completion of three years. This would be a 10 kilometer long tunnel or so with, uh, with an, attack, an attack from both ends. The actually encountered geology might be a very difficult fault zone, not a difficult fault zone, but a very difficult fault zone of 1.2 kilometers plus one, in, one intrusion which had not been found beforehand of 800 meters length. The real time for completion would be four years, although performance is as per the contract and the cost increases 30%. This is approximately the statistics we've seen before. Now, um, of course, if we have contractors take all those risks all the time, either the cost of our works will go up, cost stability will go down, or the contractors will go bust. And this is what happened to the Australian uh, tunneling industry of the past 10 or 20 years. And this is why we find we need something particular in terms of risk allocation. Also, what we find is that a balanced risk allocation will lead to the lowest possible project costs. If we have all the risk allocated to the employer, there is no incentive to the contractor to perform and he will take longer it, and it will cost more. If we, allo if we allocate all the risk to the contractor as things are in an EPC contract typically, a uh, FIDIC silver book contract, FIDIC by the way says you should not use the silver book for underground works contracts, it says this in the introduction to the silver book. <clears throat> if you allocate all the risk to the contractor, either the contract will price it which means the, 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 uh, the, uh, the contingency for risks will be too high, you'll pay too much for your project upfront, or the contractor will not price it, which means he will take a risk he actually cannot take, and he may really run into trouble. Anyway, you will have a lower uh, risk, uh, a lower cost stability than with a balanced risk allocation. A balanced risk allocation, and this is experience worldwide that shows it, will lead to lower project costs. So what we see is that underground works are 
uncertain due to the difficulty in predicting ground behavior and unforeseen conditions. Tunnelers are like astronauts, they go to places nobody else has ever been, which means there are unknown features. We have three unique features in underground works. Method of excavation and ground support are major factors for the successful realization of the project and therefore are part of the works. This is not like in other uh, FIDIC contracts where uh, temporary works are at the charge of the contractor or the contractor's business. Temporary support in underground works should be considered part of the works. Physical access to the works is often limited to a few locations, which places serious constraints on construction logistics and on the environment. And then lastly, the land beneath which the works are to be constructed typically belongs to a number of third parties. This especially applies when we're talking about cities. May apply to, it of course may apply to, uh, to deep tunnels <coughs> outside cities as well, which means that the allocation of underground risks among stakeholders becomes critical. Underground works demand special contractual consideration and the new FIDIC Emerald book addresses these specificities. So what we say in the end is that the ground and groundwater related risks should be assigned to the employer as the party who will most benefit from the completed project and as the party who can best control those risks. It's also the employer who has had time to assess the risks beforehand while the contractor during his tender has a limited time and very often cannot assess, reasonably assess those risks. So if the ground is worse than anticipated, the employer should pay and if the ground is better than anticipated, the employer should profit. This, that's fairness, and this is a, balanced, a balance in risk allocation. Now, a few words about task group 10 and about the process of drafting this book. Task group 10 was constituted uh, of seven members Four from the ITA side, besides me, there was Andres Marulanda, Charles Nerak, and Martin Smith from ITA, and three members from the FIDIC end, Jim McClure, Hannes Hertel, and Gustav Eriksson, <coughs> people from all over the world, which total over 200 years ex of experience in tunneling and underground works. And then there was, of course, very important Sultan Zahoni, at that time, the chair of the FIDIC Contracts Committee, who was the liaison to our task group, and who was a real facilitator. So I would like to take the opportunity to thank my fellow members at Task Group 10 and to thank also Zoltan Zahoni for the huge work they've done. Um, there were a few questions that we had to answer first. One was about the form. Should this be a bolt on uh, typically particular conditions of contract to be bolted onto other forms of contract like the yellow or the red book, or should this be a standalone form? We decided in the end to have a standalone form because uh, it is so important for the industry, it would get a different visibility and it would also allow us <coughs> to uh, tailor the book to the needs. We modeled the book on the 2017 FIDIC yellow book, the second edition of the yellow book, which is a contract, a form of contract for works designed by the contractor, which means that the final design will be done by the contractor. And this, although um, we found that the employer should take some responsibility in preparing uh, its tender and it should take, uh, it should take in particular the, uh, go to the length of doing a preliminary design which is rather precise. So, and we would also need a measurement contraption which is closer to the red book than to the yellow. But at the same time, we decided that uh, it was actually up to the employer to set the cursor and to say how much work, how much design work and how much design responsibility he wanted to hand over to the contractor. And we have a series of significant innovations and differences uh, uh, 
regarding underground works. Task Group 10 was constituted in 2014 uh, after long discussions, discussions that took years and years, uh, Task Group 10 was constituted and we, draw, we drafted the book over approximately two years. <clears throat> Then we lost a year of time because we were waiting for the Fiddick Yellow book to be finalized, second edition to be finalized, and we had to stop working to moving target. We waited uh, for Fiddick Yellow to be finalized, and then we finalized our draft, and then we went to the review process. The review process involved uh, several people from over the world, uh, 40 professionals and more, from, from all parts of the industry, we have contractors, designers, engineers, um, lawyers, dispute adjudicators, insurers. We had people from uh, at least 30 countries, among which South Africa. And based on this, we prepared a final draw, which went to legal review, and then it went to a final review by the Contracts Committee of FIDIC and of the uh, Executive Council of the ITA. And we launched the book approximately a year ago in Naples. Now, what is this about? A few things about the concept and about key principles. Let's take the simplest possible example that came to our mind. A tunnel which only will need support, no lining really. Support will be lining, support will be the final lining. This Typically, there's a water tunnel, a water transfer tunnel of one kilometer length, 500 meters, 500 meters of very good rock, 500 meters of very poor rock, only one access possible. You can't go there from both ends, which leads us to this kind of a program, if we want. Huh? We have an estimated production of 10 meters per day in the good rock and an estimated production of one meter per day in the poor rock. Now, as we go and do the tunnel, several things may happen. We may have the situation where the encountered conditions are better than foreseen in the baseline schedule or in the schedule of baselines, as we called it in the end. We have more favorable conditions the contractor advances according to the contractually agreed production rates, but we have 600 meters of fair rock and 400 meters of poor rock, which means that time for completion comes down from 550 days to 460 days, and the, the, the contractor will be measured against 460 days of time to complete the tunnel. The employer can pretend 90 days early commissioning. But, of course, we may have uh, a different scenario. We may have a scenario where the, uh, where the rock is worse than what was expected. And we may also have the scenario where the contractor performs better than he was expected to do according to his bid and according to the contract. If this happens, we may have a time for completion if we have, let's say, 400 meters of good rock and 600 meters of bad rock, we will have 90 days more. We will have 640 days of total time for completion. This would be a time adjustment in terms of extension. If the contractor performs better than what was estimated, we would have the, uh, we would have the, the, the black line here. In this case, the contractor will get paid for 90 days more, although he walks away early because the, the fact that he walks away early is due to better production on his end. This is his risk and this is also his benefit, whereas the ground is worse, which means that the employer should pay for that. Meaning, we want a balanced risk allocation. We want a geotechnical baseline report that describes the situation and the schedule of baselines, which is sort of a, a bill of quantities for time. We want a clear cut between foreseen and unforeseeable physical conditions, and we want a time and price adjustment and not only extension. Balanced risk allocation. This is a fundamental principle of all fitted contracts, of course. 
is particularly paramount to a positive outcome for works, in particular for underground works, and the employer will take all ground-related risks, whereas the contractor will take all performance-related risks. Now, the employer taking all ground-related risks means that the employer will describe those risks so that the contractor can price them. And as long as any situation lies within the description given by the employer, the performance will be a risk to be taken by the contractor. It is only once we, uh, want, if and once we get outside uh, the, those described risks, the set of described risks, that the employer will have to take a risk related to performance. Unforeseeable physical conditions. There is, a, of course, there is an unforeseeable conditions clause in uh, FIDIC 4.12 in the yellow book, which has been changed slightly, but in a very important way for the Emerald book. All subsurface physical conditions described in the GBR are deemed to be foreseeable and all subsurface physical conditions outside the scope of conditions defined in the GBR are deemed to be unforeseeable, which means that when it comes to uh, the subsurface conditions, the question whether a reasonably, or whether a risk should have been reasonably foreseeable by an experienced contractor is not a question that has to be answered anymore. This is a wording which is, um, quite elastic, let's say. And we wanted to have a clear cut and we went to the length of saying what is foreseeable according to the Emerald Book and what is not. Meaning, we would have, among, if we have all possible ground conditions, we would have all those conditions identified in the, in the GBR, which means they will be foreseeable, deemed to be foreseeable, whereas those underground conditions not foreseen in the GBR will be deemed to be unforeseeable. We will have a contractual geotechnical baseline. The, contract, the geotechnical baseline report and the schedule of baselines will define the, uh, the risks, the allocation of geotechnical risk, and will also define the, the way of measuring time adjustment. GBR is about the allocation of risk and the schedule of baseline is about how to measure time. Now, the, the definition of the GBR is, is extremely important because it is a definition which is different from what, for example, the American Society of Civil Engineers uses and which has been defined beforehand by uh, very knowledgeable people. And um, we want to go one step further the Geotechnical Baseline Report means the report entitled Geotechnical Baseline Report as included in the contract. That describes the subsurface physical conditions to serve as the basis for the execution of the excavation and lining works. So it is about the description of the subsurface physical conditions. It's about the subsurface conditions. It's not about surface physical conditions, including design and construction methods, which means that, as we all know, the behavior of the ground will depend on our method of construction and support. If we allow the rock to settle, as is done with the new Austrian tunneling method, for example, we allow the rock to deform, um, we will have a different behavior of the ground than if we, have, uh, if we put in a very rigid support. If we do a tunnel with a tunnel boring machine, the essential qualities of the ground will be different from those essential qualities if we do the same tunnel with another kind of method, with drill and blast, <clears throat> or when it comes to soft ground with four poling or ground freezing. So it is including design and construction methods and the reaction of the ground to such methods. The GBR sets out the allocation of the risk between the parties for such subsurface physical conditions, which means the, the GBR englobes not only a description of the ground, but it also englobes the way of 
how we want to do the tunnel and what we expect in terms of reaction of the ground to the way uh, according to which we want to do the tunnel. The schedule of baselines is the agreed benchmark of expected conditions, quantities and production rates in terms of time. And then we have a, a guidance for the preparation of tentacle documents. We come to that a little later. So we will have conditions identified in the GBR, which are the expected ground conditions. And some of these conditions will be described in the schedule of baselines. Not all of them may be described in the schedule of baselines. Some of them may be described, which means that for all those described in the schedule of baseline, not only we know that they're expected, but we also know how to measure them. If there is something that happens as we go, which is described in the GBR, but which is not foreseen in the schedule of baselines, we will have to define a new rate of production for this very event or for this very condition, as we have it in the bill of quantities for cost, according to the Red Book. So adjustment of time for completion, <coughs> Against all other Fiddick books, we're talking about adjustment of time for completion, not only extension of time for completion. Why is this? Well, we've seen before that if the ground is better, the, there's a right of the employer to have a shortening of the time for completion, a reduction of time for completion, and to dispose of this facility earlier than expected, as long as the, uh, the difference in the ground condition will influence, will positively influence the, the critical path of the project or of a part of the project. So we don't need a claim procedure for adjustment of time for completion. This all goes through a very, uh, very standardized mechanism of measurement. <clears throat> the tools for adjustment will be the completion schedule and later on program, the schedule of baseline, baselines and the remission. All those tools are prepared by the employer in the standard and have to be completed by the contractor in this bid. Then the contract price shall be adjusted. Why? Because as we said before, this is uh, if, the, if the employer has to take responsibility for the ground, this means that if we have 400 meters of bad ground instead of 500 meters and 600 meters of good ground instead of 500 meters, it will cost less. It will be remeasured. We mean, this also means that we don't have a claims procedure for this. It is a, a mechanized, standardized method, which should also uh, lead to a, a far, lower, uh, far lower risk of having claims and uh, of having disputes. <coughs> We need for, for this, in order to do this, we need the schedule of baselines, we need the measurement uh, contraption, and we need, of course, a bill of quantities. Regarding the, uh, the question, are we in a situation of unforeseeable physical conditions or are we not? This is a fork. When we, have, when we encounter subsurface physical conditions, the question is, are they identified in the GBR or are they not? If they're not, they're unforeseeable physical conditions. We go to sub 4.2, 4.12, and we have a claim for extension of time, and we may have claim for cost. Of course, those claims then will have to be assessed, and there, uh, from there, we will go back to 13.8, and we will assess things through measurement as far as possible. As long as a condition is as identified in the GBR, uh, if it is encountered same as expected, there will be no adjusted, no adjustment if it is encountered in a different way from as was expected, we will have an adjustment through the measurement, remeasurement contraption in 13.8 in terms of time and in terms of the contract price. So the new Emerald book changed a few things uh, against the yellow book. It changed, fifth. we have 15 new definitions. We've changed eight definitions. We have 30 new subclauses and 27 changed subclauses against the yellow emerald book. We changed roughly about 15%, I would say, of the yellow book. And what is very important, and this is the real 
innovative thing, I would say, about the ML book. We have extensive guidance for the preparation of tender documents, and we have annexes to this. The guidance for preparation of tender documents is a guideline for the employer on what he should do before he goes to tender, because a contract will only be as good as the tender. If you have a poor tender, you'll have a poor contract. And this means that the uh, employers should, the employers, all employers should get used to uh, preparing their tender carefully. And we give uh, extensive guidance on what should be done before going to tender in underground works. So now a few things about the content. We have a bill of quantities. This is about definitions. Uh, the numbers you can see here are the numbers that you will find in the book book is organized according to clauses and subclauses, and this is the numbering you'll find in the book. So we have a bill of quantities, there's a measurement, we need a bill of quantities in order to measure. We have a completion schedule. <coughs> Why we do need a completion schedule? Completion schedule is the document entitled completion schedule as included in the contract, stating the time for completion for each of the works, the sections, and or the milestones, as the case may be, and setting out the logical sequential links between each time for completion. This is a little complicated, I, I agree. <clears throat> the problem is that um, in a tender, we normally don't have a program. Program is not a contract document, but we need some um, commitment of the contractor to his, product, uh, to his production rates and to a construction sequence, which leads to time for completion. We also want to know how and in which sequence the contract wants to do work. This is why we need a completion schedule, which is a list of milestones and which sets out the links between those milestones. Once we have a contract, the completion schedule will be translated into the first program and it will not be used anymore afterwards. We need something to uh, transfer the contractor's commitment from the tender phase across the signature of the contract to a situation where we have contractual definition. We have the employer's requirements, which are more or less the same in terms of definition, except what's yellow here. We, have, we want to know something about required equipment, key equipment that would be requested by the employer. And we have the preliminary design carried out by or on behalf of the employer, the employer's reference design, which is part of the employer's requirements, very important. We have then definitions of excavation. Excavation includes everything that is required to excavate. It's not only excavation, it's also temporary support. It's also exploratory works, it's preliminary mitigation measures, ground treatment and so on, everything which is required in order to safely excavate and support the tunnel. Whereas lining is the works required to permanently line and support the excavated space and so on. And this may be done at the same time of excavation, which means you, have, you don't have a real temporary support, you have a support which will, uh, which will be used also as a final lining, or you may have a final lining which is put in, in at, at the second time. Geotechnical baseline report, we've been talking about this. The geotechnical data report is the objective data that have been collected by the employer beforehand, which are handed over to, to, to the contractor as an information. In terms of contractual importance, the geotechnical baseline report will have a very high importance and very high precedence over other documents in case of contradictions, whereas the geotechnical data report will be in the bucket of all other contract documents. It will have a low, uh, a low contractual importance, but it will still be there. Schedule of baselines is this BOQ time, as we had before. And then we have a def definition of time for comp uh, completion, which is um, which includes this adjustment mechanism. We have the extension mechanism under extension of time for completion. This is as per the yellow book or adjustment of time for completion according to the measurement of better or worse uh, rock condition that, well, than what was expected. 
Then we have the definition of underground works. This was a long discussion at the very beginning. What is underground works as we understand it? We define underground works as all works located beneath the natural or man-made surface of the earth, including ancillary surface works. This means that part of underground works will also be the ventilation stacks, for example. Um, also, underground works means that those works that are underneath the natural man-made surface of the works, once they're done, this means that an open pit, uh, an open pit car park will be underground works if it is covered at the end. This also means that we can use the Emerald Book for uh, works that include geotechnically complex parts, like, for example, as I said, an open trench car park, or also a complex dam foundation. You may use the Emerald Book in order to do this. I once said jokingly, you might use the Emerald Book also for construction of the Burj Khalifa, because the, the particular parts that are treated differently in the Emerald Book are only the parts that regard, uh, regard the underground portion. Everything which is above ground will be a lump sum as per the, uh, as per the yellow book. Then we have the definition of uh, unforeseeable. We've talked about this before. Now, <clears throat> I come to a, uh, to a feature of the Emerald Book, which is the adjustment feature. Adjustment is treated under uh, Subclause 13.8, measurement of excavation lining works and adjustment of time for completion and the contract price. First thing, only the excavation and lining works shall be subject to measurement, which means that all other works, all other works, shall, be, shall have a lump sum price. Contract price and time for completion shall be adjusted following such measurement, which means also that the price and time for completion shall be adjusted only according to changes in the underground excavation and lining works and their potential influence on other works. If, for example, in terms of time, a change in, uh, a change in time for completion for excavation and lining is on the critical path, for a section, for a milestone, or for the works, there will be adjustment of time for the section, milestone, or for the works. As long as this is not on the critical path, there will be no adjustment. When it comes to price, we have an accepted contract amount, which consists of the lump sum for all works except excavation and mining works. And then we have the sum of rates and prices from the BOQ for excavation and lining works. The sum of these two will be the accepted contract amount. Now, once we start working and once we do the works, we may have an adjustment of the price. The lump sum for all works except the excavation and lining works will, be, will remain the same. And the total resulting from measurement of excavation and lining works will be added. Now, this total may be higher or lower than what was foreseen in the contract, which leads to an adjustment of the price. Same thing for time. We will have a time for excavation and lining according to the schedule of baselines, and we have a fixed time for all other works and activities. Of course, life is a little more complica complicated than this scheme, and very often things interlink, interact, uh, and are depending on each other, which means that uh, if we have an influence of excavation and lining on other works, this will be dealt with under the program or as it be in the tender under the completion schedule. <clears throat> of course, when we're talking about adjustment, uh, we're always talking about things that happen without any awarded claims. If we have claims for extension of time or claims for reduction of time by the, by the employer, this may add or be subtracted. Now the adjusted time for completion in case one will lead to a longer time. In case two, it may lead to a shorter time. And in the end, when we have, when we come, when it comes to adjustment of the price, let's look, take a look at the adjustable items. Adjustable items are, in terms of prices, only the sum of rates and prices from the POQ for excavation lining works. And there, according to the bill of quantities, we have three kinds of items. We have fixed rate items, 
time-related rate items and quantity-related rate items. Fixed rate items is everything which will not depend on how much the contractor really has to do. Typically, the, ins the installation of a concrete batching plant, this is up to the contractor. Time-related items, time-related rate items will be monthly rates or weekly rates or daily rates for the extension of time of making available a part of installation. Typically a tunnel boring machine or the concrete batching plant <clears throat> or the continuum. And quantity related rate items is what we know from the BOQs that we all know, numbers of rock bolts, numbers of uh, cubic meters of shark creek and so on. <clears throat> so the items and quantities will be given by the employer because it's the employer's estimate how much will have to be done from each of those and the rates and prices will be completed by the contractor. When it comes to measurement, and I will only, uh, only speak about time-related rate items, for the extended or reduced availability and maintenance of the fixed rate items according to the adjusted time for completion, we will have time-related rate items. Uh, there will be a fixed rate item for the making available of the TBM for the time that is estimated and contractually agreed in the first place by the contractor. And then we will have a reduction of time or an extension of time. And we will need, as I said before, daily rates for the making available of this item for a longer period or negative rates, daily rates for the making available of, this, of the same equipment for a shorter time. <clears throat> In order to do this, we first need to adjust the time for completion. And this again is a measurement question. We will measure in the, uh, we will measure days that it takes longer or days that it takes less. <clears throat> this is an example of a, of a possible bill of quantities where we have, uh, where we typically have the quantity related rate items, which will have to be measured. <clears throat> and where we have um, time related rate items, we have an extension of time of availability and a reduction of time of availability. In this case, in days, we said that there may be up to 150 days. It's a, this is the employer's estimate <coughs> of longer of extended availability or 50 days of reduced availability. Same price here, 3,000 euro per day or minus 3,000 euro per day. And then we'll have to go and measure this. We'll compare the total that we have in the schedule of baselines against the initially planned time. Is there a difference or not? If there is no difference, there will be no time, no adjustment of time for completion. We would then add the extensions of time that have been claimed and awarded, if any. And if there is uh, and we will then take the total and adjust and have a time for completion in the end and we will have an adjustment of the contract price. If there is a difference between the total of time in the schedule of baselines against the initially planned time, always considering the critical path, is there an influence on critical path? If there is no influence, again, there will be no adjustment of time for completion. If there is a difference, on the critical path, there will be an adjustment of time for completion to which extension of time claimed and awarded will be added and we will come up to a final time for completion and to adjustment in the contract price. This is the uh, example that we've given in the Emerald book uh, of the schedule of baselines. Uh, we have here what has been estimated by the employer 500 meters of fair rock, 500 meters of poor rock. We have the, the production rates estimated by the contractor, 10 meters per day in fair rock, one meter per day in poor rock. And then we go measure. And we find that in the end, we have five, 400 meters of fair rock and 600 meters of poor rock, which means this will add up not to 550 days, but to 640 days. Then come the other things that have been put into the schedule of baselines, hindrances, interruptions, and hindrances from, from, uh, from water seepage. 
all these are hindrances to production, which the, uh, the employer has described in its geotechnical baseline report and for which it has estimated the quantity. The contractor will estimate an influence on its production through those events, and this will add up to the contractually agreed time for completion. We then go measure what happened, and we will add everything up, and in the end, we will come to a, uh, to a result. What I also found out when I prepared this presentation was that uh, I had made a mistake. We had made a mistake that nobody had seen in the, in the, uh, in the example given in the Emerald Book. So you please correct this. This is, should actually add up to the 15th January of 2021 under this example, and not to the 5th of November of 2021. So what happens here is that when, when, that when we add up everything, instead of, coming, uh, of finishing the works according to the schedule of baseline and according to the, uh, to the adjusted time for completion on the 15th January 2021, the contractor has the right to finish the, the works by the 5th of May of 2021, which means he gets another 109.6 days awarded and he will, pay, he will be paid for the making available of his equipment for 109.6 109 days more. This is what will happen once we go back to the, uh, to the, to the bill of quantities. We had a bill of quantities that foresaw 150 days of extension of time, of adjustment of time in terms of extension, and we will measure 110 of these 150 days in the end, which means that he will get for the, uh, for the fixed and time-related rate items, instead of getting 2.69 million, he will get 2.73 million, or 71 million or something like this. So, um, this would be the end of my presentation. I would now like you to put you to ask your questions. I've seen there have been a series of questions and I would like Camila to take over and to tell me how we should deal with that. Thank you very much for your attention so far. Thank you, Matthias, for a very informative talk. Um, there are not that many questions at the moment, so I'll just run through them quickly and maybe you can respond to them as they come in. Uh, the first question was from Saul Klopper, who wanted to know, he says the 11,000 projects, ref projects referred to, are they underground stroke tunnel related projects only, or does it cover a wider spectrum of projects? Um, may I, uh, just a sec. Uh, these are, uh, as far as I'm aware, these are underground projects. That's, that's, this is not the statistics that I did, I ran. This is a statistics that was found by one of my fellow mates on uh, task group 10 on the scientific journal. Okay, thank you. And then another question from Graham Roberts. He wants to know whether your presentation uh, can be made available to attendees after, after this webinar. Uh, I've sent a presentation in PDF to Camila and it can be made available, yes. Okay, thank you very much. And then uh, just a quick question from my side. Um, listening to your, your presentation, Matthias, it's obvious that the, the geotechnical baseline report, the GBR, is integral to the successful application of, of this Emerald Book form of contract. Um, and my question is, what safeguards are they in, in this form of contract or in the application of this to a GBR being written so broad that all the risk is essentially, in terms of ground, that all the ground risk is essentially transferred back to the contractor, whether it's in terms of available data, unforeseen, um, if, I mean, yeah, can you, can you respond to that? Yes, sure, there is none, there is none. There is no, there is no safeguard against abuse. Uh, you, we cannot protect, we cannot protect employers or contractors against abuse of the system. That's not possible. Of course, when it then comes to a, uh, to a dispute adjudication process or when it comes to arbitration, uh, of course, the, uh, the, 
the dispute board or the arbitration tribunal as it be may take into account the, the a, a potential abuse of the contractual system. But there is no way of, uh, of saying where the cursor should be set. Okay, no, thank you. Um, I can maybe just, Camila, can you just open up uh, my fellow panelist, Monique Weinstein? Uh, she's also on the Sandgood com Committee. I, in case she's got a question, I, th I think those are the questions from the attendees that I've dealt with. Monique, you uh, can go ahead. Ahead. yes, I'm here. Monique, you can go ahead. And, um, Karat, there is a question in the um, Q and A box from Graham Roberts. Uh, just a sec. Ah, here we are. Okay. Yes, I can see it now. Um, Fifty percent contingency should be added to subsurface works. I agree that the top, say, twenty meters just below surface, may have significant changes. Does the same hold true, true to deep underground mining? Well, the point is that the longer a tunnel and the deeper the tunnel, uh, the less possibility you will have to perfectly assess the ground. Very often, when it comes to um, subsurface works in uh, in an urban setting with low ground cover, of course, there is a high risk of damage you may do to, uh, to uh, adjacent structures or to the environment. But then you also have a possibility of assess your ground fairly well because you can do a whole lot of boreholes. Whereas when it comes to long deep tunnels, uh, it is very difficult to have a perfect assessment because the, the boreholes or the, uh, the investigation campaign would just cost too much, if I may make an example at the Gotthard Base Tunnel in Switzerland, which is the longest rail tunnel in the world. Um, the employer invested uh, some 150 million Swiss francs, which is approximately 150 mil million US dollars equivalent. Uh, in the 1990s, that was a time where the Swiss franc was worth more than today. Um, invested $150 million in exploratory drifts and in, uh, in extensive, uh, in extensive uh, test drilling campaigns to find out where the geotechnical risks were. This did not prevent the project for, uh, from running into a series of uh, very uh, difficult situations. Whereas the, the main risk that had been found, <clears throat> that had been found, uh, in the end turned out to be something very straightforward and easy to deal with. Which means that um, when we're talking about those fifty percent, this is also uh, this is also based upon statistics in uh, European may in European works that are complicated, complex, and that take a long time. This is the uh, this is the, the, let's say, this is the, uh, the baseline that you should take into account uh, if a works is, uh, does not let you know the ground very well in advance and if it, if it will take a long time, uh, the risks are high and the unknown unknown is particularly important. And the, uh, the statistics come from uh, works that we have assessed in several European countries uh, for the purpose of estimating the risks to be taken into account for the, uh, the Swiss nuclear waste repository, which will have to be constructed in about 20 years time or so. So the question really was how much contingency should be uh, taken into account and what was found out was that based on to the, the net calculated cost without anything on top in terms of risk, you should add 50%. And this uh, is due mainly to the duration of the works, to the complexity and to the lack of information. If you get more information, you can come down a little bit. 
if you have works that won't take a long time, if I'm looking at my kilometer long toe, the simplest example, you wouldn't need 50% of contingency on top of that. Uh, and if you have good ground information, you may come down a little bit as well. Thanks, Matthias. There's another question from Nick Chittenden. Um, he wants to know the contract needs to be adopted by the client. Are there any ideas on how to present the benefits to the client, especially where that client may be very inexperienced in underground works? Hi, Nick. Good to see you. Um, um, that's not easy. That's not easy. Let's put it that way. Many clients favor a silver book contract because they think that they can shift all the risks to the contractor. If you do this, uh, several things may happen. Either all contractors in the tender process will price the risks, which means that you will have extremely expensive works because um, the contractors will have to price all risks whereas not all risk will materialize. This is one possibility. Another possibility is that the low bidder has not priced all the risks. He, he runs into risks and he runs into problems. And there, again, several things may happen. You may run into a condition where the contractor simply goes bust, which means that uh, you will lose years of time and you will lose uh, X percent of what your budget was just because the contractor ran away or went bust. Um, the contractor may start, uh, let's say, managing his contract in a particularly active way, which means that you'll be facing a lot of disputes and you'll be facing also the menace of the contractor leaving the works which uh, also may cause you problems. And according to the legal framework you're in, uh, this, may be, uh, this may be a problem to the project. So if, uh, if it takes, uh, if it takes a, a, let's say an argument to convince an employer why he should do this is that uh, in underground works, uh, the excavation and lining is as much part of the works as everything else. So as when a contractor or was, when an employer does the assessment of his nuclear power plant or of his hospital or of his uh, uh, correctional facility or of his school, uh, as long as you're not facing excavation and lining, you can describe your needs in a very functional way. Once you have to deal with excavation and lining, things become complex and complicated. Of course, Nick knows this. The question is how to convince, uh, how to convince employers. Now, what's happening with, uh, with FIDIC and with the ITA is that both FIDIC and the ITA are uh, recognized partners to the United Nations, to the World Bank and to the multilateral development banks, which means that um, the Emerald Book is something which is being progressively adopted by uh, the different multilateral development banks. And of course, if the banker uh, is convinced and if the insurer is convinced, and this comes, uh, a series of inputs have come from the insuring, uh, of the insuring industry, um, if the banker is convinced and if the insurer is convinced, they may have a fairly strong uh, stand with the employer to convince him to uh, adopt a certain way of uh, describing a contract. But of course, nobody can be, uh, we have contractual liberty almost all over the world, which means that uh, nobody can compel a, an employer to use a, a particular kind of contract, unless you're talking about a multilateral development bank, of course. Thank you, Matthias. So we're at 11 o'clock now, so I'm going to wrap it up. There are two other questions which we'll respond to afterwards. 
Um, so just on behalf of the Sandcup Committee, I think in the first place, Matthias, thank you very much for a very uh, clear and concise presentation. It was well worth uh, listening to it. Thank you very much. Uh, also, thank you to my fellow panelists, Monique Weinstein, and then just lastly to Camilla Jardine and Gugu Charlie at, and all their colleagues at the SAIMM for, for setting this up for us. Thank you all for attending. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.